I'm curious, do you think that it's possible to cheat when you're making art? I ask because I was recently called out for cheating in my last one color challenge video. But more on that and how it seriously inspired me to up level this challenge after I inventory all of my green art supplies. I am 98% certain that I have more green art supplies than any other color. For this challenge, I'll be using 217 different art supplies, which include 28 markers and pens, 10 different paints, four bottles of ink. That is definitely blue, and I am pulling that one out. 14 Neocolor 2 crayons, two yellow, 13 ink tents blocks, 14 ink tents pencils, to blue, 14 Karen Dosh Museum Aquarels. I think that's too yellow. 16 Pan Pastels and 104 colored pencils. And I also happen to have five green nail polishes, so be sure to keep an eye out for how I created all green art with these two. So what exactly did that comment say that called me out for cheating in my last one color challenge video? I think that using white and blue, even if to mix with the pinks, kind of damaged a bit the original proposal. It reduced the level of challenge. Simple Living 431, I totally get where you're coming from, but the way that I think about challenges is a jumping off point. It's a way to get your creative juices flowing and give you some constraints so that you aren't going into a blank page without any ideas. And that's exactly what this pink challenge did. When I grabbed the blue tube of paint in that pink video, it was to mix in with my pink so that my pink would recede into the background a little bit more. And that solution allowed me to create more depth. I also used a bunch of white supplies so that I could mix them with my pink supplies or use them on top of my pink supplies so that I could have lighter values. And when I look over my green supplies, there aren't any really light materials that I am working with. And so I'm going to need to bring some whites in so that I can lighten the value and have a lot of contrast. Because when you're working working with color, it's all about creating as much contrast as possible so that your image can really shine through. Contrast in value, contrast in temperature, and contrast in intensity. This critical feedback was also accompanied with a helpful back and forth and ultimately a really useful suggestion. This viewer suggested that I work a little bit smaller and that really resonated with me. So for this challenge, I am gonna work smaller, but I'm not just gonna create one small piece, I'm gonna create three small pieces, one with my true greens, one with my blue greens, and one with my yellow greens. In each small drawing, I will be sharing some tips and details about the supplies that I use and how you can use a variety of media effectively together. And you're going to want to stick around to the end because I personally think that the last one turned out the best. And by that point, I'd figure out a few tricks with the supplies for working efficiently and expressively. For the ducks, I started with a thin layer of paint that unified the entire piece. And then I came in with markers to establish the shadow shapes. Throughout this process, I have kind of fallen in love with using alcohol markers in mixed media pieces. They can be used on top of thin layers of paint and can also be used under water soluble media without moving around at all. And they lay in so fast. For this piece, I focused on the alcohol markers on the tighter shadow shapes in the ducks and in some more concrete shapes in the water. And then I transitioned to ink tense blocks, ink tense pencils, and museum aquarelles to build up color and value and to create more expressive marks. These Neocolor 2 crayons are also water soluble and they are so fun to work with, but they have more body and lay down more material and more texture. So I often use these a little bit later in the process and I use them to add more texture and more dimension to my piece. I can still continue to layer other materials over the top of them though, if I keep the layers relatively thin.
Next, I used eight different pan pastels to create some soft textures and transitions, but I'm going to speak more on that and how to use pan pastels with a variety of materials in one of the other pieces, so stay tuned for that. Regardless of the type of colored pencils you use, there is at least a little wax in them, and waxy materials resist water and water-soluble media. So I typically save my pencil work for articulating and finalizing the texture once I have the initial lay-in complete. My goal was to use every single true green colored pencil in this piece, but I wanted each pencil to actually matter, not just to be a random ripple in the water. So with each pencil, I tried to give it a specific job and bring it throughout the piece in at least a few different places. It's true, I could have created a similar piece with fewer materials, but the extra challenge of using every green art supply really encouraged me to use a variety of different greens and to play around with hues and shades in a really playful way. As I worked on the texture in the ducklings, I brought in my white colored pencil and even my white marker to heighten the value, and I didn't even feel bad about it. And although I could have added a ton of detail into the ducklings, I intentionally chose to keep this piece a little looser and to have some edges open and unfinished. Deciding when a piece is done, what area has the most detail and attention, and what areas you leave more open and loose really matter when you're making art. In fact, consistent choices like this made over time compound and contribute to establishing your own unique and authentic style. I have personally been exploring and experimenting with my unique artistic style over the last couple of years, and I've noticed that this experimentation has been seeping into my personal life, my communication style, and even the way that I approach my self-care routine in really fun ways. My time is really precious to me, and it often feels so incredibly scarce that in the past, I've completely skipped prioritizing self-care, convincing myself I just didn't have the time, and my self-care never extended to beauty. Maybe I'm alone in this, but a task like painting my nails has always felt like a waste of time because if I do happen to do a halfway decent job, it usually ends up getting chipped or damaged within a day or two. But I've recently done a 180, indulging in the occasional creative manicure, and this all started with Maniology reaching out and asking me to try their nail stamping products. I'd never heard of nail stamping, and at first it sounded like a way to make an already time-consuming process longer and more tedious, but I was intrigued because the representative from Maniology talked about nail painting with such passion and was using the same phrases and words that I used to talk about making art. I decided to give the products a try and I am really glad I did. As I selected the color scheme and designed the composition, I realized I was essentially creating mini wearable paintings and I loved it. And as an extra bonus, the thicker specialized stamping polishes required for this process are much more chip resistant and I still have a perfect set of nails well over a week later. Gear up for a girl's night in with a fun starter kit or indulge in some much needed self-care with a completely customized set of products. And when you use the code LANA10 at checkout, you'll receive 10% off your entire order. I'm gonna leave more information, including the website and the specific products I used in the video description. Water-soluble pencils and blocks are a great option for mixed media work, especially for artists that are comfortable working with traditional colored pencils and graphite already, because they have the familiarity of your preferred medium, but you don't need to spend lots of time with blending techniques. Instead, you can scrub color in really quickly and then use water to soften the edges and blend things out. One thing that I really like about the Inktense line is that once they've been activated and dry completely, they won't reactivate, which means you can continue to layer and layer without any of your previous work changing at all. And this right here, this is a water-soluble marker. Oh my gosh, I love these two. Another great way to add texture, but have the option of softening it later. Color psychology connects specific colors with specific moods and even behavior. And artists can use this information to evoke emotions and influence the way their artwork is perceived. In general, green is associated with optimism, hope, rebirth, and balance. And its association with spring and new life guided me to select the subject of the mother duck with the ducklings. But different shades of green take on different energies. And when green moves more towards yellow, it begins to take on the emotion associated with this color, which include happiness, spontaneity, and excitement. When I selected a subject to draw for my yellow green piece, I considered the psychology and selected this chicken with the sassy set of feathers 
colors on top of its head because it felt fun and vibrant. What do you think about the color selection and what subjects might you draw if you were only working with yellow green? Okay, prepare yourselves because I'm about to cheat again. These dark greens aren't quite going dark enough, so I'm going to bring in just a little bit of black. And here I go cheating again. I've got my White Pit Artist Brush Pen. This pen is amazing because it sticks on top of just about any material you can think of, and it brings those whites back in so that you can really lean into value contrast, which can be hard if you're just relying on colored pencils. I'm gonna stick a link to this particular supply and a couple of my other favorites that I use throughout this video down in the description if you want some more information. I wasn't originally planning to draw another bird, but when I saw the ducks and the chicken together, a theme was clearly starting to emerge. So I looked through my inventory of photos for a bird that would look great in blue-green. Blue is associated with calmness, relaxation, and stability. So a blue-green tends to have a much more calming presence than a yellow-green. Do you feel that too? While I was searching for photo references, I felt that this color would go best with a large, more substantial bird, and I felt that the composition of this bird looking down from the trees in this blue-green color created a sense of safety and serenity, like a guardian watching over the forest. Although there were a lot of opportunities to inject texture in the trees and the feathers, I wanted to have some larger areas of calm and the pan pastels were a perfect way to do this. I am working on hot press watercolor paper and this surface has a light tooth that is great for mixed media work. Because the ink tense products and markers didn't alter the tooth of the paper all that much, the pan pastels stuck great. I used soft tool sponges and mixed up the two lightest shades to create a light value color that I could apply over the whole background. On a more textured surface like pastel mat, you can really lay down a lot of material. But on a smoother paper like this, I like to keep the coverage a little bit lighter and use more pressure with the sponge to create smooth blended transitions. If the pastel coverage is light, colored pencil, marker, paint, and a variety of other materials will lay over the top just fine. But do keep in mind, pan pastels are going to continue to be malleable throughout the drawing. So it's a good idea to place a paper or something else underneath your hand and work carefully so that you don't smudge your work. I'd love to hear which of these is your favorite and if you would consider trying out one of these one color challenges. If your answer is yes, be sure to check out this video next where I share my four step process to mastering color. See you in the next video. Bye.